Um, I, I'm just uh, wanting to, to open the conference, but uh, my name is Chris Alden. Uh, I'm the director of the Global South Unit. I, I'm actually going to step down uh, and invite uh, uh, Stuart Corbridge, Professor Stuart Corbridge, to open, formally do the, the honors with respect to opening the conference, and then I will speak. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, buenos dias, good morning. It's my very great pleasure as the Deputy Director of LSE to welcome you to the school uh, for this second annual CAF LSE conference, which this year is on the theme of geopolitics in the global south, challenges of the emerging international order. Uh, as my title suggests as Deputy Director, I very often stand in for our Director, Craig Calhoun, and very often I find that Craig is traveling, and when he's traveling, he's usually traveling to Latin America. Uh, he sends his greetings today from Chile, where he's taking part in a major public event uh, with President Bachelet. Recently, Craig, just before Christmas, was also in Colombia, uh, where, of course, President Santos is an alumnus of the school, and he's very regularly visited Brazil and Mexico. I think it's fair to say that no director in the history of LSE has paid more attention to and is more interested in partnership with Latin America than Craig Calhoun. Uh, for my own part, looking out here at some colleagues from the diplomatic community, I have been closely linked uh, through Costa Rica, particularly over the past eight years uh, with uh, the Latin American community here in London. So it is fair to say that the leadership of the school has never been more excited about the partnership that we are now building with Latin America. And partnership, I think, is the theme of the conference today in many ways. LSE is extremely grateful to CAF for its generous support of this conference and for the scholarship that you provide to a student from a CAF member country to study uh, the MSc in International Relations here at LSE. We also, thanks to your generosity, host a visiting fellow in international relations, and we're particularly delighted that President Garcia himself is now a professor of practice in our Department of International Relations, where he works closely with Professor Chris Alden, who you just met, the head of LSE's Global South Unit, and Dr. Alvaro Mendez, who, along with Chris, has been instrumental in organizing this conference. So thank you to all of you. I should say that the conference itself and the Global South unit seem to me to be classic LSE enterprises. LSE has a large amount of regional knowledge amongst its faculty, but we tend not to approach regional issues through an area studies lens. <laughs> LSE tends to be mainly interested in putting research in the service of public good around core international themes, geopolitics, migration, climate change, dealing with the rise of China, dealing with the United States and Europe. We're particularly interested, and the Global South Unit is a key vehicle for this, in South-South trade, South-South international relations more generally. We're interested in the collective action problems that face all of us, and we're particularly interested in learning from different parts of the Global South. And I notice that colleagues are here this morning from many regions in the Global South and not just Latin America. And that seems entirely appropriate for the way that LSE, as an institution, would tend to approach these issues. Let me say finally, too, that the LSE has recently launched an Institute of Global Affairs. Uh, we believe that this will be uh, a very unique vehicle for the study of international affairs. We will have within the Institute of Global Affairs some obviously thematic units. We will have soon, I hope, a Centre for Women, Peace and Security. We already have LSE Ideas, which is our vehicle for understanding diplomacy and statecraft. But we will also build into the Institute of Global Affairs a number of regional centers. We have a South Asia center already, a Southeast Asia center, a US center. The school already has a prominent European institute. And I hope within the next four months we will have a Latin America center. I firmly expect that we will. 
and an Africa Centre. And these centres will be vehicles for dialogue across the regions around these cross-cutting thematic issues. <coughs> Very much bound up with that, I'm delighted to say, and you might have seen this in the press, that the first director of LSE's Institute of Global Affairs is Professor Eric Bergloff. Many of you will know that Professor Bergloff has recently stepped down as the chief economist of the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development. Eric has been heavily involved recently in debt restructuring issues in the southern periphery of Europe. He's been involved in the restructuring programs in the Ukraine, and he has a strong interest himself and regularly visits Latin America. These issues of restructuring, these issues of persistent balance of payments problems, of debt restructuring, of course, was particularly important in Latin America in the 1980s, will be something that will be taken into the IGA and will bind our study of Latin America and our conversations with the region into these broader understandings of global affairs. So your conference today and LSE's link with CAF, which we hugely value, will I think be instrumental in building this particular understanding of South-South relations. Um, I'm actually very upset that I can't spend a great deal of time here today, although I will get back from time to time. But you're all very welcome at LSE. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, I will <coughs> want to welcome you to, to the LSE, to this particular conference. I want to say a few words about uh, the conference itself and then about the Global South Unit before I introduce uh, my, my colleague and, and friend, Enrique, Pre President uh, Enrique Garcia. Um, the uh, conference is on geopolitics. It's, a, it's perhaps geopolitics in the Global South. It's a reflection of, and in fact, uh, uh, if you like, uh, uh, reality imitates uh, art, as it were. When we thought of this, some of the crises that uh, have uh, been characteristic of, of the last uh, few months were not apparent. Um, Ukraine perhaps was unfolding. The ISIS crisis, uh, uh, crisis in, in the Middle East had not reached the, the, the position it had. Um, and of course, oil was uh, uh, still over $100 a barrel. We're in a, a new and emerging world, and we think that this is the right opportunity to discuss the impact of these phenomena across uh, uh, the regions, the Global South in particular, and hence the focus of the conference. So we thought that this would be the right time to bring, and as I said, uh, a, real, a real time event seemed to be vindicating that, uh, the right time to bring uh, this issue, this angle, to our discussions here. Um, if you can permit me to say a few words about the Global South unit within the International Relations Department. It's a, a, as Stuart has already said, it's a research and, and teaching program. It's one that has focused on de uh, developing or so-called developing regions, emerging, uh, emerging regions, the South-South cooperation in particular, the dynamics of interaction uh, between them. We've done, uh, we, we have a, a research agenda, a policy-orientated work agenda, and we've held a number of conferences. This, of course, re remains our, our, our uh, central uh, event of the year, a calendar event of the year, but we also have done uh, a number of other events. A uh, conference in, in Turkey in, in December on responsibility to protect. Um, in, we'll be uh, running a conference on Myanmar, looking at uh, uh, the, the embedding of stability and democracy and, and the, the problems that that uh, uh, country would encounter. And then we'll be having a, a workshop in May in Vietnam, looking at second tier powers and their response to China's. In addition to which, as, as, as Stuart has already said, it's, we've had scholarship programs. Uh, the, the, the CAF has been a generous supporter of that. Uh, fellowship programs, we also have a, not just a Latin American fellowship, but an African fellowship as well. And perhaps most importantly, leading me to, to my, my introduction, is we have a visiting professor of practice. Uh, who, who uh, Enrique, President Enrique Garcia, who happens to also play a, a role in a bank somewhere, I'm not sure what, uh, in addition to teaching it. So, uh, um, 
Uh, I don't, I, I know it's one of those classic things where one says, I don't need, he needs no further introduction, but I'll just say one or two words. Um, uh, uh, Enrique Garcia has been uh, 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 an academic in his, in his first phase of his career. He's, uh, um, but si subsequent to that, has played a role in the Ministry of Finance uh, in Bolivia. Uh, in, uh, um, he has played a role with, uh, played a, a key role as an economist. Uh, and ultimate uh, in the Inter-American uh, Development Bank, and uh, ultimately the last 20 plus years uh, with CAF, with the, with the Latin American Development Bank, where he's played uh, the leadership role, really, in taking one of the most uh, significant institutions and turning it into uh, a global, a global uh, concern. Uh, President Enrique Garcia. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, well th thank you very much for your kind introduction. I'm, I'm very honored, very pleased to be here this morning. And I would like to make a clarification. I think Chris very kindly mentioned the fact that I've been in, in CAF more than 20 years. It, yeah, it's true, I've been reelected five times. But one very important thing, I have been reelected without changing the Constitution. That's, <laughs> that's a very, very important thing. Well, let me, let me say that for CAF, uh, Development Bank of Latin America, it's, it's a great uh, honor to, to be here this morning. This is the second year that we have this conference, and this conference is a very relevant input for a development bank, because I, I think that development banks uh, should be looked upon not only by the fact that they provide financing for programs and projects and infrastructure and social sector support. But I think the very fundamental thing is that they should be institutions that are quite linked to knowledge. Knowledge in a broader sense. Uh, knowledge to, to help countries, to help regions develop, uh, develop sound strategies for the development, but at the same time being capable of recognizing the realities of the global world today. And one of the characteristics of CAF, is perhaps many of you don't, are not aware, CAF was born 45 years ago as a, a small, a sub-regional institution of the Andean Group. And nonetheless, in the last 20 years, it, it has moved from a sub-regional concept to a regional concept. And we have one characteristic that perhaps is unique in, in the global uh, institutions in the development institutions. We are perhaps the only one that is in essence owned by emerging countries because out of 19 countries that we have right now, uh, there are only two countries outside Latin America and the Caribbean, which are Spain and Portugal, but they have less than 5% of the, of the capital. Well, this is a very, very important element because it means that the institution is quite committed to an agenda for the region is quite committed to understanding the differences, to try to reconcile those differences, but at the same time, we cannot be provincial in the sense that we look at ourselves. And so CAF has a, 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 a vocation, I would say, to interact with the rest of the world. In, in, in fact, we have excellent relationships with the United States, with China, with the UK, with all the European countries, uh, with Russia, and so forth, in trying to build up partnerships in financial, academic, and intellectual sides. Now, going to the intellectual side, I think that what we have tried to do, in the last, especially in the last 15 years, is to build up a, a chain of linkages with institutions around the world that are relevant uh, in many aspects. And precisely, um, we are very pleased that here in the UK, uh, we have this strong partnership with the LSE, which is indeed a, a, one of the important characteristics of this institution is precisely the global view. And to understand the issues of Latin America, it's very important to understand the issues of the world. And let's go back to a year ago. A year ago, we had a different environment. We had an environment in which uh, still we were very pleased in Latin America because we were in a process of very 
very solid growth, uh, the, the impact of, of the previous crisis in, the, in Europe did not affect that much the region, but now things have changed. We see what has happened in the last few months. The drop of oil with positive and negative things. We, we see that the recovery of, of Europe is, is becoming very difficult. China is slowing down, is, is, is showing a, a change in model. Uh, all these impacts, and well, let's go to other things that are so delicate. Let's see the terrible things that are happening in the world. We see what has happened last year in Crimea and Ukraine. We see the ISIS, we see Syria, and most recently, the tragic events that we have seen in France in, in the last two weeks, which really calls our attention about the new realities of the world. And of course, we have the issues of terrorism, we have the issues of narco-traffic, and in the economic side, the issues of multilateralism and security in other elements. So the question is, well, many people should ask, well, why is that the development bank is, is having a conference on geopolitics in the global south? Normally, in our institutions, they, they have a conference on competitiveness, on how to reduce poverty, but this is not typically a topic of an institution like ours. Well, quite the contrary. I think this is a very important input for decision making and for an institution like the one I'm, I'm, I'm honored to preside to have a vision of what Latin America should do to insert itself in the realities of globalization. So let me uh, reaffirm our vocation to in intellectual uh, interchange, and we have a change or a chain of uh, relationships in addition here in the UK, we have also a partnership with Oxford, we have Sans Point in France, several universities in, in, in Spain and in Portugal, and of course in China and in other parts of, of the world. So we are very pleased and I'm sure that with the quality of the, of, the, of the agenda that we have today, and particularly I would like to thank very much the quality of the speakers. We have distinguished personalities that are joining us and that I'm sure are, go are going to enrich our knowledge and will be a very stimulating and constructive event. So thank you very much and to LSE, thank you very much for all the support. It's a great pleasure to work and interact with you and I hope we'll continue doing many positive things in the future. So thank you very much. Well, now we start the real business. Huh? It's we we'll start with the the first uh, the first session, in which we'll have a, a keynote address on geopolitics and the global south, and it is indeed a a great pleasure and an honor to introduce uh, my good friend, former President Ricardo Lagos of, of Chile. All of you know President Lagos. President Lagos is a, a great statesman. His career is a, a career that is something that uh, all citizens of Latin America and around the world should admire. He's a man who has dedicated his life to some principles of democracy, of constructing a better societies. He has been um, uh, one of the first actors in the when Chile reestablished democracy uh, some decades ago as a minister and then won the elections and was a, a one of the great presidents of that country. And after a successful presidency in, in Chile, uh, Ricardo has uh, dedicated all these years to topics that go beyond Chile. They, they are very, he's quite committed to regional integration quite committed to the things that precisely in this meeting we're going to discuss, the issues of democracy, of human rights. He understands very well the geopolitics, so we are quite honored and thankful, Ricardo, to, to have the opportunity to listen to you and especially to your kindness to accept to be the first keynote speaker for this event. So I'm very honored and very pleased to introduce President Ricardo Lagos.
But let me tell you that uh, you shouldn't listen very careful to what uh, Enrique Garcia just said, because uh, as he said, he's a very old friend of mine, and that's the whole reason for what he said, what he said. <laughs> <laughs> After saying that, I, I think that uh, it's really a, a quite a nice uh, arrangement to have uh, something like the London School of Economics and the CAF, the Latin American Development Bank together, in order to tackle issues that normally, as Enrique has just said, are not in the area of a banking institution. Nevertheless, it seems to me that uh, given the description that has been made this morning by the previous speaker, uh, when Chris Alder was mentioned about uh, what is the emerging, what are the challenges of the emerging international order, well, apparently there is an international order that is in the process of being made. And apparently that means that the old international order is over. Now I keep thinking, what is the old international order? In order to know what is the new one. And needless to say that uh, apparently Mr. Kissinger last uh, book, he is missing the old order. And apparently the old order is the one that started just a few years ago, 300 years ago to be more precise, with the Westphalia institutions. And needless to say that somebody can think that the last stage of this world of equilibrium between nations, because that was Westphalia at the very end. Well, at the very end, at the world stage, the Cold War, and the equilibrium between the U.S. and the USSR, you can understand that was the last of the order of Westphalia, even though beyond the European borders that as Westphalia was defined. The question is, there is a new order. Did we go from a bipolar world to a multipolar world? Or probably it's right when in a similar seminar like this one, somebody say, no, sir, you are wrong. We are living in an apolar world. So there is no pole at all. It's a polar world. Apolar. How could you say in English? Apolar? A polar world? It's no pole. Huh? No polar world. Because there are so many poles today that apparently, who is the one that is in charge? Or they are Everybody's in charge. How is it possible to be living in the 21st century and a plane goes down, nobody knows what happened, and what is worse? The total world has observed without being able to reach the place where that world is. What kind of international order when nobody can guarantee that you can reach where <laughs> are the rest of the plane? It's amazing. It's very difficult that something like that may emerge in the Cold War. So there is no question that there is an emerging world order. But what is, what is emerging? And I don't need to say that we are living in a world of uncertainties. Uncertainties in terms of international security is very obvious and has just been told to you. Incertainties in economics, when we already have more than seven years after the major economic crisis, and still we're trying to find the light at the end of the tunnel, in Europe at least. And therefore, this is quite unusual from the point of view of what we used to think that we knew before 2007, 2008. And needless to say, and this is much more serious to watch is the economic problems, the sense of either irrelevance or illegitimate situation in political institutions. When you see that here in Europe, the answer to internal political problems in many of the countries in Europe is the extreme right or the extreme left. Extremes because they are outside 
the mainstream of what we used to know as the normal political debate. You can understand in this country from conservatives to labor, labor to conservatives, then you have something new, the liberal and the play being ruled by the liberal, but all of that is within the existing political institutions and the legitimacy of that institutions. Nevertheless, today we are observing that this institution has been eroded. Here, in my own country in Chile, when the degree of uh, are doing a good work, political parties, 4% will agree with that. 6% are doing a good job, members of parliament. My goodness. And we used to think that we are a democratic country, you know. And why I say this? Because I think that this is the most serious part that we have to face. To what extent our democratic system is being undermined because we are unable to deliver what we are supposed to deliver. Or probably because in this new world, the demands of the emerging middle classes, precisely because we have had success in the previous 20 years, now we have to face a different world. So I would say, look, if there is no international order, what about the multilateral institutions that are supposed to provide some kind of international legitimacy or some kind of international orders? I don't think that I need to discuss here the issue about the Security Council and the five permanent uh, veto powers, etc., etc. I only would like to remind you that one of the best institutions, the World Trade Organization, has been not very really successful lately, during the last uh, 15 years. And therefore, what do we have in front of us? And it's my feeling that what we have in front of us is an order that is emerging because either of major countries, continental powers, if you allow me to say, if we are thinking in terms of uh, uh, China, uh, India, uh, probably Brazil among us, uh, South Africa in, in Africa, plus probably what about the European Union, assuming that the European Union can speak with one voice? Or what about the United States, that is another continental country, like China or India? And that means then that if the emerging order for the time being is not an emerging order among 190 something countries, it's not the General Assembly of the UN, of course, but probably. What do we have now is either the emerging order that is emerging is through huge continental countries, if you allow me to use that, or some kind of regional countries that <laughs> represent a particular geographical region in the world. And therefore, you can have major actors four, five, six major actors, and the only question is that the kind of challenges that we have, none of them are able to solve alone, but without any of them, it's very difficult to advance. Let's see the World Trade Organization, just an example. It's just one block of the regional block that can say, no, I don't agree, and don't agree, and we are unable to advance. Why I say this? Because if this is the case, then I would say that, yes, from the point of view of geography, what may be the global south? And really, I have a problem with that title. Because I keep thinking, what do we mean global south? South of the Ecuador line? OK, that's fine. But then India and China is in the north. <laughs> that's my problem, you know? And I would like to have India and China in the south, so I'm going to be stronger. 
And then the global south would be only Latin America, not Mexico, of course, but Latin America and the south. And then would be South Africa, and then <coughs> Australia and New Zealand. And that's it from a geographical point of view. But I would like to think that global south is a little bit beyond the Ecuador to the north a little bit. But other than that, I would say that in the case of Latin America, and I'm talking about from Mexico down, well, there's no question that in the last decade has been a wonderful one. Rapid and speedy the recovery after the 2008 crisis. Democracy is the rule in the region, but uh, there is no question that emerging middle classes uh, are demanding a new things, a new areas. Poverty has been defeated to a big extent, not only because of growth of our economies, but also because we learn how to do, uh, how to deliver well <laughs> focalized social public policies. Well focalized social public policies. And growth plus public policies produce the result that we all know. And therefore, there has been also a huge cultural progress in terms of freedom. We have been able to face the, the heritage from the previous dictatorship, etc., etc. And needless to say that also in Latin America, we can see much more international players that would like to play a role in the region. And that means then what are the openings by China, India, and some other big players, and even including Russia. But the question is that at the same time, there have been changes from the point of view of the economic kind of situation. We used to be living in a world where the developed country has a very high growth rate, and we were trying to catch up. Things have changed very rapidly during the last uh, 10 years, when developed countries used to have a growth rate of 3.5 percent, but uh, the crisis been minus 3, and now it's 1.9. While the world is 5.6 in 2004, and while in the case of emerging countries, 8 percent during 10 years, 8 percent. Vis-a-vis -vis what? Vis-a-vis -vis three and a half on the develop. And this is why the OECD like to, instead of emerging countries, like to talk about converging countries. And the definition of countries that converge are those developing countries that are able to have a growth rate twice, twice the average of OECD countries. It's very e easily to understand that if you have a growth rate twice the other developed countries, you are going to converge in a few years more. And what do we have now then is uh, a question extremely important in terms of that what happened in Europe is not only a question of growth, it's a question of the distinction that you have to make in the case of China or United States, that about 12% uh, or 10% of total imports belong to those two countries. I mean, United States and China. But in the case of Europe, and the three of them are much more similar in terms of percentage of, of the total gross domestic product of the world, the big difference is that Europe represents 31% of total world imports. So United States represents only 12, China only 10. But Europe, 31% of total imports is here in Europe. And therefore, the impact from the point of view of the world trade that Europe is in the situation where it is now represent a tremendous challenge for the world. It's not the same 
to have a zero growth from the European point of view than you have a zero growth from the United States point of view. And this is where the major problem that we are facing now. That therefore, there is no question to say, and this explains why, up to 2010, the growth of the world trade was much bigger than the growth of the world total output. And this has been so during many, many, many years. The real engine of growth has been trade. And now trade is behind the growth of the world output because of Europe. So it's not only a question for you Europeans, it's a question for all of us what's going on here in Europe. And therefore, it's my point of view that in the case of Latin America, we have tremendous challenges ahead of us, not only because what is today's situation from the economic arena, but also in terms that it's very difficult for political leaders to understand <coughs> that if we have been successful during the last 10 years with different social and economic public policies, well, we have to understand that because of our success, we have changed our own countries. And because we have changed our own countries, then this means that we have to change what are going to be the right public policies vis-a-vis -vis the future. It's quite different to discover that you can defeat poverty. My goodness, it's much more difficult. How can you satisfy emerging middle classes? And that is quite a different story. Because to satisfy emerging middle classes, normally, you will need to provide some kind of public services, either health, either education, either university at the third level. My goodness, how expensive is that? And who is going to pay for that? And therefore, I think that here, Latin America is in a new economic cycle because we succeed in the previous one. But we have to turn the page and see now what are our own duties. And I would say, from the political point of view, the question of legitimacy. It's not only our own problem. It's every day, every, everybody's problem. But the real issue is what? The real issue is how you're going to introduce legitimacy to our own political institutions vis-a-vis -vis the web. In, in just two words, democracy has to be representative, has to be an institution able to deliver and to talk to each other, but also will need some kind of participation. The big issue is how much participation and how much representation. And the web means that all of us are able to talk at the same time. And if you are uh, going with uh, this kind of uh, seminar being on the red, on the web, well, probably many of you have been in seminars where you are receiving the tweet, the Twitter that people are answering the brilliant ideas that you are proposing. And at the end you have, what are you going to do? I'm going to answer the Twitter that I'm receiving or I'm going to keep talking with the audience that is here? And, and this is really a new kind of political challenge. What are going to be the institutions? How much participation, how much representation? I will leave there, but that's a very important issue. From the economic point of view, I think that we in Latin America, how are we going to increase our competitiveness? To what extent we can find and define a new alliance between the public and private sector? In most of our countries, in most of our countries, investment, the private sector, is something between 65, 70, or 80 percent in most of our countries. And if that is the amount of investment of the private sector, and the public sector is more than 20, 25 percent, then how are we going to be able to define a long-term purpose in each of our own economies 
in order to increase competitiveness, what about the rate of saving that we have? And then the big and most difficult issue, how much of the growth rate are going to be destined to increase investment or to improve distribution of income? Either if you go only for distribution, you have no future. And either if you go only for investment, I think that the democratic system will have some problems. Therefore, how and where? And if you include then the question of emerging middle classes, then the question that you have probably to increase the participation of the tax system. What percentage of the tax system is going to be suitable? 10%, 12%, like in most Latin American countries, or 18%, like in <laughs> most uh, medium income countries, or are we going to go to 25%? And this is another question, what about from the point of view of our fiscal policy? How are we going to be able to introduce an improvement in our public sector institutions? And what is more important, what about science and technology and to what extent we are going to be able to have a public and private partnership with regard to science and technology. And here then we have at least from the social point of view, the question of urbanization that is growing and what about our own cities and needless to say the question of uh, climate change and education. To sum up, I think that here we have uh, an agenda in our own society that is going to be extremely important. But to return to the question of the international order, I would like to say that I don't like what I see in Latin America vis-a-vis -vis the emerging international order in what sense. If there's going to be a place where some regional arrangements are going to be very important, then the question will be, Till what extent Latin America is prepared to participate in an emerging world by which we can be considered a region? I know this is our problem, but up to now, we are not going in the right direction. It's true. During many, many years, we have talked a lot about integration. And then we have uh, several institutions in that regard. We have Mercosur in the, in the 90s, and Mercosur at the same time was, uh, well, everybody wanted to belong to Mercosur, but Mercosur now is becoming more uh, a political institution rather than a source of economic integration. Then we have the UNASUR, and the idea was how we're going to be able to UNASUR to have some sort of integration from the point of view at least of infrastructure and energy. In a sense that those institutions means how we're going to be able to link in a better way our own countries. And then, because you have a Mercosur here, the so-called Pacific Alliance emerged, that to some extent I would say it's a, an economic group of countries that has a, one similarity that the, our trade economies are extremely open, like the case of Mexico, like the case of uh, uh, Colombia, uh, the case of, uh, to some extent, Costa Rica, uh, Peru, and Chile. And because you have this alliance, Pacific Alliance, so-called, vis-a-vis Mercosur, on the other hand, or the Atlantic countries, then many people used to think, for the first time, that you have two different Latin American countries. Countries that are the Pacific one and those that are in the Atlantic. And as I say in another meeting of half uh, in Washington, uh, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, I say, I don't like that. Because you know, I remember that 500 years ago, the Tordesillas Treaty, during those days when the discovery came, and the discovery means Spain and Portugal. And during those happy days, 
the international order, when you have an agreement between those, those two kingdoms, the kingdom of Spain and the kingdom of Portugal, they had an agreement in Tordesillas, and they, they took the agreement and went to see the Pope. And in those beautiful <coughs> ones that the Pope signed the agreement, then that was it. That was the order, you know? And the order was, well, from here to there belongs to Portugal, and the new territories from here to there belong to Spain. And that is the people that today speak Spanish, and this is the people that today speak Portuguese or Brazilian, as you prefer. <laughs> uh, I have been told that it's not exactly the same, you know, to speak Brazilian and speak Portuguese. But other than that, I would say, look, and this is very serious, I don't see why in Latin America we are going to accept that distinction from the political point of view. Let me explain. When we are talking about the Trans-Pacific Alliance, United States is looking south. And in the Trans-Pacific, you have Mexico, you have Colombia, you have Peru, you have Chile. And of course, the Trans-Pacific means also the Asian countries, Australia, New Zealand, etc., etc. By the way, the Trans-Pacific, you know, what is the origin of the Trans-Pacific Alliance? The small agreement of very important countries. First was Chile and New Zealand, then Singapore went there, and finally Brunei. And these four major countries in the world established then this alliance. It took some time for the United States to discover that this alliance was open to other countries, and the United States said, I would like to join that. And then be began the real Trans-Pacific Alliance. My only problem with this agreement, other than the, the substantive issues of the agreement, that in many areas, what you are doing through this agreement is to redefine what was our free trade, our, our, mine, in Chile, free trade agreement with the United States. And the same with Peru and the same with Mexico. But that's another story. My major problem is why the United States is looking south and United States is not looking south when United States decided to have an investment and trade agreement with Europe. And as far as I know, Mexico has Pacific and Atlantic coast. Colombia, needless to say, Pacific and the Caribbean is Atlantic. But at the same time, when you talk about Europe, it's normal that Europe is Italy. Greece, from the point of view of security, uh, NATO, uh, is uh, even Turkey. Today is Poland. And as far as my geography knowledge is, none of those countries are in the Atlantic. And then, why Europe? It's just one voice, no matter if you are not in the Atlantic, but from the point of view of making decisions, Europe is one. And why we, Latin America, that are in the middle of a change of economic power, at least, moving from the Atlantic to the Pacific. The Atlantic was the major engine of the trade world during, right after the Second World War and was the major engine till at least the late 20th century. And now the major engine is moving to the Pacific, and we Latin America are in the middle of this current, going from this place to another way. That means that if we have coast to the Atlantic and to the Pacific, I think that we in Latin America, if there is something like geopolitics, geopolitics means that we have to speak with one voice. It's true that lately, then we have the so-called CELAC, the Latin America community of states, of Latin American state, and it's true that that is a political institution. If it is possible in that political institutions to have an agreement in the real issues that from the, our point of view are extremely important, can we have a common point of view about drugs? that is becoming something about the world of it? Can we have a common point of view with regard to migration? 
And by the way, migration is not only a problem south to north, because migration also is within Latin American countries. And I do not like to consider migration a domestic policy issue. It's an international issue. And the right to migrate has existed over the planet since the human being existed. And it's very unusual to be living in a globalized world where everything has been globalized, less the right of the human being to move from here to there, or trying to fix the problem. And therefore, you cannot accept, from my point of view, that the question of migration is only a question of develop versus developing or whatever, or how I'm going to be able to build a, a wall. It may be necessary to have a wall, but then let's do it together and let's put bridges, bricks if you want to build a wall on both sides and not from one side. After saying this, I would say there's many other areas that are in the international agenda. What about climate change? What about the uh, trade, for instance, etc.? If this is the case, then the big issue is going to be how are we going to be able then to face these new trends? And why are we going to be able then to what extent is our capacity to solve our own problems? And this, I think, is extremely important. The fact that the United States accepted, uh, two or three years ago, President Obama accepted to have some discussion on drugs, this was because now the most important document with regard to the drug issues is the report that the Organization of American States was able to present. And if we are able to have that kind of document with regard to some other of the problems of the international order, I think that we are going to be able to present our own policy proposals in this regional polar world. And from this point of view, I do think that it's possible then to understand that uh, this new geography that is emerging, I understand quite well. You cannot have as a yardstick to integrate just one single variable. I understand that Brazil may be a much more closed country vis-a-vis -vis some other countries that because we are smaller, we are much more open. In the same way that you understand here in Europe that some kind of variable geometry is going to be essential. You can be in the Euro area, 16 or 17 countries, and you cannot be in the area like the, the UK. But that means that in general terms, you still belong to 28 or 29 European Union and the, and the several countries that are part of that. The Seven Ingen Agreement with regard to migration, well, you can accept it or not, but that doesn't mean. We in Latin America have to learn to understand that integration doesn't mean that all of us have be in the same boat. And you can have disagreement, but in the long run, you can have a very powerful international ag political agenda from the point of view of the region. And I think that this is why it's so important, this kind of discussions. And this is why uh, the fact that uh, uh, in, in this particular area, we have to understand that geography doesn't mean what used to mean. I learned about uh, two years ago that the major port in the Pacific, in the southern part of Latin America, was not in the Pacific, but in Cartagena de Indias, in the, in, the, in the Caribbean Sea. Most of the ships today, from Chile, from Peru, uh, from Ecuador, from Colombia, from Mexico, that are on the Pacific, they have, it's not in Panama, or in Callao, or Valparaiso, they have, is in Cartagena de Indias because that is the most efficient port from the point of view of containers, period. So, the, in the new economics, geography is not what it used to be, and this is something that we have to keep in mind. In short, I think that we have in Latin America a tremendous challenge. If we are going to have a a dialogue with United States and Canada in our own hemisphere, then I think that it's possible to uh, conclude 
that uh, this kind of dialogue between inter-American countries may be extremely useful. But at the same time, I do think that if we can speak with one voice, like in ZELAC, vis-a-vis many of the items of the international agenda, then we can be of some uh, interest in order to be able to be talking from the Latin American point of view. Final point, going back to geography. And a small anecdote. I was uh, going to be interviewed by BBC uh, for some issue that uh, probably was of some interest. And at the same time, from Europe, Mr. Prodi was going to make a talk also. Mr. Prodi was interviewed from Bologna, and I was to be interviewed from Santiago. The only problem that I could listen to Mr. Prodi, but Mr. Prodi couldn't listen to me, because the only way to go from London, from the BBC London to Chile, was through Washington. And something happened between in Washington so that they can get the signal from London, but was not possible from Washington sending to Santiago. So it was not possible to talk about to each other. And the optical fiber didn't work. And then I keep thinking, what that means from the point of view of the global south? If it is possible to have a fiber between the southern part of Latin America to the South Pole, and from the South Pole to South Africa, and from the South Pole to Australia, and then we are going to change because now everything that we like to talk to each other, those countries belonging to the South, can only talk to the other southern country through the north. If it is possible to change that, I know that this is political fiction probably, and an economist will tell me, look, you are very mad because the cost of that is going to be rather high. But if we would like to talk about from the point of view of the global south, the real global south then would be South Africa, will be uh, Latin America, and will be Australia. If it is possible for CAF to think about what if we try to advance and to have also a global south with optical fiber, or we have to wait till the next 30 years for that. In short, I think that there is something like a global south. For the time being, I prefer a global south that looking north and people like China and India is part of the global south because they are still in the process of development very much like the one that we are in Latin America. And therefore, I think that for the time being, this emerging world order is going to be more and more a global, not a regional emerging world order. And when you have no countries, then, then you have a regional people. This is why you have a, a year agreement between Europe and, and China, Europe and India, etc. And therefore, this is why I think that unless we do our own homework in Latin America, it's going to be very difficult for us to participate in this emerging world order unless we, as a region, speak with one voice. And thank you very much. is, is uh, uh, against us to an extent, but, but uh, President Largos, after a wonderful speech which sets the tone for our discussion, has, has time for one short question. Can I take, can I, uh, take one from the, the lady over there? Considering that uh, Bolivia has a case against Chile accepted by the International Court of Justice uh, regarding a situation of confinement, uh, which clearly difficult um, the integration of Latin America and particularly and generally the integration of the Global South um, due to a tendency of Latin American countries to integrate uh, to other countries in the world, 
except of or instead of regionally in Latin America. Wouldn't you consider, as a former president of Chile, uh, that solving this uh, controversy and this problem is fundamental to move towards the integration of uh, Latin America? What would, you, what would be your solution uh, in order to solve this problem? Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for your question. I think that is quite lively. <laughs> but uh, let me be very clear. As a former president, I was president of Chile during six years. And during those six years, I, I have to talk with six different Bolivian presidents. And during those uh, the six years, I devoted much more time to the question of uh, Bolivia than any other country in the region. Because I think that there are some pending questions very important. And since, uh, I'll be very honest with you, President Banzer told me, my first president was President Banzer in Bolivia, Mr. Lagos, I have a problem. I have a lot of gas. I have to export gas in order to make some profits for Bolivia. And if I export gas, I have to do it through Chile, because the Chilean coast. And therefore, I'm going to export $400 million a year, gas to Chile. And you will take the gas, you will liquefy the gas, put on a boat, and export. And export for Chile will be $1,500 million. Do you think that I can explain to the Bolivian people that this is a good business? 400 versus 1,500? And I say, Mr. President, that's very easy to solve. According to the agreement, to the treaty that we have, 1904, all merchandise that is in transit has to be processed to any Chilean port, free of charge for Bolivia using our Chilean ports. Therefore, I will offer you an amount of land big enough to have your own factory there, to liquefy the gas. And you will export your gas, because according to the agreement, it's in transit merchandise. And that in transit merchandise today, you had to put in a container. In 1904, there was no container. But according to the, the real agreement, that is in transit that now you put in a container. If you're going to export gas through a pipeline, well, at the end of the pipeline, you liquefy it and you export your gas. You will export the $1,500 million, not Chile. And then President Banzi say, and can we do the export in a Bolivian ship? Well, that's your problem. If you have a ship, Bolivian ship, then do it. It's your gas. You will see whatever you want to do. And we keep working on that position. We make a discussion about what kind of labor legislation? And I say, look, if you use, uh, are going to take Chilean people, Chilean, otherwise, I don't care. If you have your own people coming from Bolivia to work there, wonderful. Number two, no taxes are going to be applied in that part of the territory that is going to be given to Bolivia for 99 years. And the only restriction is that if you spit in your car a little bit beyond what is Accepted, the ticket is going to be given by the Chilean police. You see what I mean? And uh, it was a, a, very, a very important, almost, unfortunately, President Banzer died. Even though we have no diplomatic relations, I was the only head of state that went to the funeral of President Banzer, and I wanted to do that because I wanted to demonstrate that I was talking seriously with the Bolivian friends. Now, the question of sovereignty, access to the ocean with sovereignty, is a little bit more difficult because that does not depend on Chile. Because the only way to give sovereignty to Bolivia is through a corridor, in the, otherwise Chile is going to be cut in two, is through a corridor between Chile and Peru, in the north, north part of Chile. And according to the agreement that you have with Peru, if Chile or Peru 
would like to give land to a third country, in this case Bolivia, you need the agreement of the other part. In two, in two occasions, in 1950 and in 1978, 1978 or 75, Pinochet and Banzer were dictators, both of them in, in Bolivia and Chile, and they agreed to have a corridor. The same that in 1950. At the, in those two cases, there, there was not a very happy end, and at the end, the, as somebody say, the key is in Peru, and Peru had to accept that. Because of those two offers is the reason why now we are in The Hague, because Bolivia thinks that if Chile makes the offer of building these corridors, then that means that Chile thinks that there is something pending with Bolivia. And this is the title. From my point of view, it's, it's not a very good case in a sense that there is a treaty, the treaty is legal, and the treaty is there. <coughs> 1904. I wonder what may happen in Europe if treaties that are valid today are going to be revised by some international court, given the fact that in this continent, as far as I know, there have been many changes in the limits between one country and the other. So that would be my answer, you know, and I hope that there's going to be a, a way to, to solve the issue because I do think that we have to recognize that between Chile and Bolivia, we Chile have to recognize there is an asymmetry in the relationship because of the different kind of development in Bolivia and in Chile. Final point is interesting. There was in one way a summit to discuss how different Latin American countries can help Bolivia. used to zero all the tariff of those goods and services coming from Bolivia to Chile, and that Bolivia will take the time if they think that it's fair for them to reduce tariff from Chile to Bolivia. And I told to my colleagues in Latin America and say, I will ask my colleagues a big favor, that what I'm going to give to Bolivia you will not take that and take me to the World Trade Organization asking the same benefits. The benefits are for Bolivia. Because if you say that sugar that is exported from Bolivia to Chile is going to be also asked by Brazil, I cannot give this to Bolivia. Do you see the point? And, and this, I think, is very important to keep in mind. I do think that uh, we should be able to that in the long run, uh, something will have to be solved. I doubt that the solution came from The Hague, but that's the decision of the Bolivian government. Th that would be my answer, really. All right. <coughs>